The following special program, A Bend in the Big River, the story of Pine Bluff, is made possible by a grant from Simmons First National Bank, proud to be a part of the Arkansas Sesquicentennial Celebration. Centuries before the arrival of the white man, Quapaw Indians lived along the banks of a great river. These Native Americans were especially fond of the rich terrain surrounding a series of evergreen bluffs located at a bend of the river. Today, we know this spot as Pine Bluff, one of the most special places in a state now a century and a half old. the founding fathers of the Arkansas Territory were beginning to settle the dense hardwood regions west of the Mississippi. The movement of white settlers spelled the end for the people who gave our state its name. In 1824, the Quapaw agreed to leave their final encampment just east of the Pine Bluffs, migrating westward into Texas. Eight years later, in 1832, four years before statehood, land was purchased and surveyed for the city of Pine Bluff. Forty blocks of land were offered for sale in the Arkansas Gazette, and within a few short years, the town consisted of dozens of log cabins. One of those early homesteaders was a Kentuckian named Dexter Harding, whose historic home still stands as a monument to the people who laid the foundation for this community. Sawdust from Harding's sawmill was piled in a shallow lake north of his home, making a bridge that linked the north and south parts of town, on a site where the town's civic center now stands. Dexter Harding was very significant to the development of Pine Bluff because he was the first person to establish a sawmill and in turn sawed most of the lumber that built the first Pine Bluff settlement. Jane Watson runs a tourist information center inside Dexter Harding's restored log home. And he is unique in the fact that he was an artisan. He was a very fine artist and portrait painter himself. He was very talented in the musical arts and he was not the usual carpetbagger that settles some of the cities in Arkansas. He was a very refined, cultured gentleman. Pine Bluff grew steadily in those early days. Steamboats brought more and more settlers upstream. 
But in the 1860s, this same river became the highway for military forces of the North and South. In 1863, Union troops took control of town. In October of that year, rebel forces fired on the city in a futile effort to drive out the Federals. According to historian David Perdue, the Jefferson County Courthouse was at the center of the battle and barely survived the fireworks. The Jefferson County Courthouse was the focal point of the battle. It was behind the cotton bales and about the only thing that could be anyone they, they could see to shoot at, anything that they could shoot at was the courthouse itself and uh, we believe that the cupola was shot off and uh, a lot of artillery was directed toward it. All the streets leading to the courthouse were uh, manned with artillery and sharpshooters, and it became a, a very deadly uh, contest of artillery and sharpshooters. Uh, I might mention that uh, I have a relic here of the uh, Battle of Pine Bluff, and uh, this cannonball is a six-pounder cannonball that uh, apparently hit the roof of the courthouse and either the copper flashing or either the roof was uh, all of copper. And it, it, the, the shell did not explode and carried into the ground with a piece of this copper still on it. When a construction crew recovered the cannonball, it was still loaded, and uh, I unloaded the cannonball, and it is now on display at the Jefferson County Courthouse. In the years following the Civil War, the Iron Horse began writing a new chapter in the colorful history of this city. In 1873, the Little Rock, Pine Bluff, and New Orleans Railroad was completed. According to historian James Leslie, the river was replaced by the rail as the primary source of transportation. In fact, within three days' time, you could be in New Orleans, and that was fantastic for those days. More than a century has passed, and railroads remain a vital cog in the economic makeup of Pine Bluff. Passenger trains have been replaced by the freight industry, and steam engines by diesel-powered locomotives. But here in the old cotton belt shop, a bit of the town's railroad history is being resurrected to join the present. The 819, a supercharged steam-fired engine, is being renovated to serve as a living reminder of a bygone era. I have a deep interest in preserving something that will never be available again in my lifetime and not in, the, in future generations' lifetime to see what, a, what an actual steam locomotive uh, actually was and looked like. Joe McCullough is among a group of local railroad buffs who've been working six days a week for over two years to get this 44-year-old iron horse back in working order. This is the last, uh, this is the last locomotive of its, of its class in the world. It, uh, and on the cotton belt, and uh, it was given to the city of Pine Bluff in 1955, and uh, it set out at Oakland Park and was uh, vandalized, and the elements got to it, the weather, and uh, so uh, we just uh, couldn't stand it any longer, so we had to. Uh, try to get it back in and, and restore it. So this is our present uh, position on it now. And it, uh, as you can see, it's beginning to, to look uh, like a locomotive again. OK, this is the emblem on the cylinder. Originally, it was steel. We've had it done back, put back in brass, cast back in brass. So it looks better on the black. Now that the train is restored, Jake Comer and the others who've labored over this project are hoping to convince the Cotton Belt Railroad to fire up the engine and run the train on occasional excursion trips. This particular locomotive was built where it sits in the year 1942, and it's one of 10 locomotives that were built in the state. And as far as I can be been able to determine or ascertain, it's the only railroad in the state that built their locomotives in their home shops. And back in 1942, it was provided jobs for a lot of people in Pine Bluff. While the rail industry has long been an economic asset to this community, for many years, trains have also been cursed by local residents. 
Two sets of tracks slice through the middle of downtown, causing lengthy traffic jams. There is no way around the tracks, and frustrated motorists have no option except to wait till the caboose rolls by. Finally, after years of planning, this situation is about to improve. The Missouri Pacific and Cotton Belt tracks, previously a block apart, are being placed side by side, and construction will soon begin on an overpass, the first of three proposed bridges over the rails. Nearly $6 million of federal funding has been obtained to pay the cost. The cars of today are a far cry from the tin lizzies that sputtered around Jefferson County in the beginning part of this century. Early day automobilers found it difficult to drive on the dirt roads built for horse-drawn carriages. So in 1913, the county approved a road tax that built the first concrete highway in Arkansas. The thoroughfare stretched for 22 miles from Pine Bluff toward Little Rock and cost a dollar a foot to build, earning the nickname Dollar Way. Horseless carriage enthusiasts were overjoyed, but farmers along the route claimed the highway was hard on the feet of their horses. But mostly, they were angry at paying the road tax. Nevertheless, there were automobile clubs that would ship their cars in here on flat cars and run up and down the road for two or three days for something to do because there was no other concrete road of that length around. During the early days of World War II, the United States Army opened a military arsenal at Pine Bluff to produce bombs for the Allied cause. Unlike many wartime plants, the arsenal was not abandoned after the war. Today, the arsenal serves the local community as a major employer, with a workforce of over 1,400 civilians and an annual payroll of $30 million. Dewey Spencer is the arsenal public affairs officer. The uh, arsenal had seen some lean years in between the uh, times of war, World War II and Korea. There was some lean times. The production uh, picked up again in the Korean era and towards the end of the 50s was um, relaxed a little. We now have a multi-mission uh, uh, installation here involving technology, uh, engineering of uh, new items, uh, the storage of chemical munitions, the um, testing of uh, equipment, uh, filters, and things for defensive apparatuses, and uh, uh, an overall military mission, if you will, involving civilians and military personnel. on the rim of Arkansas's most productive commercial forest region, and this spells jobs for the community. Agriculture is the oldest and still one of the most important ways of making a living in this area. Farming is a $58 million a year business here, and Jefferson County is among the top three in Arkansas in the production of rice, soybeans, and cotton. Some of the planters around here own small farms and their families have been plowing this fertile land for generations. There are also a number of corporate farmers in the county who till thousands of acres of cropland. Frank Plafkin works with every class of farmer in his job as county extension agent. It is his opinion that as long as there is ground to plow, agriculture will remain an important aspect of Pine Bluff's economy. The younger uh, farmers are, are taking over, uh, that their dads are, are retiring, and, and they're becoming more active. I think uh, uh, the average age is, is probably getting younger in Jefferson County. It may not necessarily be nationwide that way, 
but uh, in Jefferson County, we have a lot of young farmers that are being active, becoming more active. Many of the harvested crops grown in this part of Arkansas are shipped to market from Pine Bluff by rail and river barge. This city is one of the few inland towns in the nation offering water transportation to ports both foreign and domestic. Built along a slackwater harbor that once was a main channel of the Arkansas River, the port of Pine Bluff offers facilities that industrial development director Wally Garinger maintains are second to none anywhere. I think the leadership in this community through the years can really be praised and praised to the highest starting back in the 60s when the people had the vision to first see the importance the Arkansas River would be to Arkansas and to the community and then aggressively go out and do something about developing the finest inland waterway port period bar none. We have a harbor industrial district which was created by the Pine Bluff Jefferson County Port Authority for the community that area has some 400 acres which have been developed as flood-free industrial sites. And these are sites upon which we hope to attract industry and business that needs water transportation, rail transportation, truck transportation, and even pipeline transportation. Community leaders seized the opportunity to develop the port when the government approved and funded the McClellan Kerr Navigation System which was completed in the late 1960s. Today, the Arkansas River is big business for Pine Bluff. But for a long time, this same waterway was a feared devil of nature, known for an unpredictable habit of overflowing its banks. In 1908, floodwaters were threatening to wash the county courthouse into the river. An unknown group of local men took matters into their own hands and dynamited the channel to allow the brunt of the flood to miss the city, thus saving the courthouse. But in 1927, Pine Bluff was hit by a flood so severe, it was deemed the greatest natural disaster in Arkansas history. She spread her arms over thousands of acres of land. And she left farms ruined, stock ground, houses torn. It's very difficult to paint a word picture of actually the situation that existed at that time. It's beyond your imagination. You would have to have seen it to really appreciate uh, what took place at that time. <clears throat> what happened? causing that condition, the Mississippi River uh, was at flood stage at that particular time, and the Arkansas River, which is a tributary of the Mississippi River, was also at flood stage. And when the waters of the Arkansas met the waters of the Mississippi, there was no place for it to go. And consequently, it just, uh, I think I've heard it said that the Arkansas River at the time actually flowed backwards. Emmett Sanders' grocery business was nearly wiped out by the 27 flood. The horror of this tragedy spurred Sanders to work for parts of five decades trying to convince Congress to approve money to control the river. Sanders headed an Arkansas delegation that made repeated trips to Washington, trying to obtain the $1.4 billion needed to fund the project. Finally, in the early 1960s, his efforts paid off. I think we accomplished it just by harassment. I think we wore them out. We were in this particular hearing before a House committee, and all of a sudden, one of the, the representatives just threw up his arms and exploded, said, thank God there's just one Arkansas River. In 1972, Arkansas A.M. and N. College merged with the University of Arkansas system and was renamed the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. The merger joined the state's two oldest public institutions of higher learning. Founded as Branch Normal College in 1875, this state-supported land-grant institution was primarily established for black students, 
who in those days were not allowed to attend many colleges across the South. The student population on this campus is still 80% black, although white and black enrollments are on the increase. A number of students choose to attend this university because it was the college where their parents and grandparents earned their degrees. A UAPB graduate, Dr. Lawrence Davis, Jr., is Dean of the Division of Arts and Sciences. His roots and feelings for this campus run deep. His father was school president for over 30 years, and his son will soon enroll as a freshman. Well, I think that not only has this institution uh, been an important uh, factor in black heritage, but it has been an important factor in the state of Arkansas. You must realize that a majority of the black professionals in Arkansas are graduates of this institution. And I think that had it not been for this institution, that Arkansas would not have progressed as far as it has. But I think that this institution is uh, more important now than ever before because it has a greater population to serve. In the 1970s, Pine Bluff approved construction of a $9 million convention center that included an 8,500-seat multi-purpose arena and a 2,000-seat auditorium. Critics claim the town was not big enough to support such a lavish facility, and during the first few years of operation, the center was plagued by financial problems. But fears the complex would become a giant white elephant proved unfounded. Today, the center hosts nearly 600 events a year. The Arkansas Razorbacks play several home basketball games here each season, and the center is the site of the King Cotton Classic, one of the most prestigious high school basketball tournaments in the country. In the past, the convention center has housed circuses, concerts, and twice has hosted the National Bassmasters Classic Fishing Tournament. Hold on to your jockey shorts, brother. We picked to tighten the band. 1815. There's your leader, folks. There's your leader. Carl St. Clair serves as both the convention center and chamber of commerce director. In his view, Pine Bluff has reaped benefits from this complex worth a great deal more than the money invested to construct the building 10 years ago. We probably have more Pine Bluff events uh, in this convention center than you would find in other cities uh, to their convention centers. Uh, we do some regional business, uh, a small amount of national business, but primarily we're a community convention center and serving our community, I think, very well. Local residents and city officials scoff at surveys like the Rand McNally Almanac that listed Pine Bluff as next to last in its ranking of over 300 U.S. cities. They point instead to a reduction in crime and the excellent hunting and fishing opportunities surrounding this community. They boast of a Jefferson Regional Medical Center, a 470-bed hospital that offers the latest in patient care for treatment of heart disease, cancer, and stroke. They talk in glowing terms about how their town serves as the industrial, cultural, educational, and financial center for the entire southeast corner of the state. But you need to talk to me for a few minutes and tell me some things that are going on. One of Pine Bluff's most prominent citizens and ambassadors is attorney Lewis Ramsey, a retired bank executive who has served on many of the state's most influential decision-making boards. Ramsey says he chose to make Pine Bluff his home and business base because of the spirit and personalities of the people that inhabit this town. But Pine Bluff has always been the kind of town that I wanted to live in. Uh, so many good things here. The size of the community is a good thing for me, 60,000 roughly. Uh, you know people in town. Uh, yet you're part of everything that goes on, or you have the opportunity to be a part of it. Uh, it has uh, practically everything that a larger city has. We look at the convention center in Pine Bluff, uh, and you think of the people that have been here, the performers that have been in, in Pine Bluff. 
Uh, and that's hard to beat to, for practically any large city like Dallas or St. Louis or wherever it may be. I think we could, uh, we could match that uh, very easily. And then the fact that uh, we have a good educational system. I look at our school system and uh, it's excellent and it's wonderful. I look at uh, our uh, hospital and that's hard to beat. Uh, we've got uh, almost 500 rooms at a, a hospital that uh, gives you the right kind of care. Uh, we've got all the other things like the port, uh, transportation. Uh, we're near to Little Rock. If we, our sister city, if we need to, to be in the uh, capital for anything, uh, we're there. Uh, 